So I just watched Evangelion 2.2, You Cannot Advance, and wow, have I never watched a sequel that destroyed everything I thought I knew about the prior film quite like this one. In this funkumentary, I will attempt to reconcile some of the observations I made in my Evangelion 1.1 analysis, as well as explore the meaning behind the new characterizations of the characters and what these changes probably all mean in the grand scheme of the Evangelion rebuilt continuity. Hello Funkers, Tony Funk here, and welcome to part 2 of my Evangelion Rebuild analysis. As most of y'all probably know, I'm taking a unique approach to analyzing the Rebuild series by reacting to each film individually, free from spoilers, from the subsequent film, and ultimately making a fool out of myself. In this episode, we will first focus on how the majority of the Evangelion cast has mysteriously diverged in personality from the original series, and much more shockingly from their depictions in Evangelion 1.1. And later, I will try to make sense of the spectacular ending where Shinji nearly causes the third impact, and see what the implications mean for the series at large. So sit down, grab a snack, and get ready for Evangelion 2.2, you are not the same. Let's first start off by looking at the major changes in Shinji. In part 1, I originally classified Shinji as having an anxious ambivalent attachment style, which made it nearly impossible for him to have friends. The largest trait preventing him from having friends being his aversion to getting near other people, as stated in Evangelion 1.1 during Misato and Ritsuko's conversation about the Hedgehog's Dilemma, and in its near identical rendition of the original series. I also stated that Shinji, though wanting to be closer to his father, was unable to put any conscious efforts to make that happen because of how anxious ambivalent types express resentment towards their estranged caregivers. Shinji does a complete 180, however, as we later see him investing time and energy in doing nice things for his colleagues, and in doing so, contradicting my observation about his anxious ambivalent attachment style and going against Misato and Ritsuko's assumption that he was burdened by the Hedgehog's Dilemma. So having stated that, let's analyze how Shinji's character is no longer consistent with his original characterization. Let's start off with the grave scene where Shinji and Gendo converse about Yui at her grave. Though they talk briefly about her, at the end of the scene Shinji expresses his gratitude for having the opportunity to speak to Gendo. Shinji later tries to downplay his gratitude during the car ride back to Nerf when Misato tries to get him to admit that it was a better idea to go see his father than to continue sulking. This to me might indicate that Shinji in this iteration of his character wants to seem a little edgier than he really is, which is not consistent with his original characterization as being genuinely afraid of vulnerability. The next instance of Shinji behaving like a healthy young man is when it is revealed that he has been cooking his own meals due to Misato's inability to cook, and actually shares his food with his friends Toji and Kensuke, as well as Kaji, Asuka, and Rei giving her miso soup since she is revealed to be a vegetarian. Shinji also expresses happiness to be able to go on the Marine Preservation Zone field trip with Kaji, expressing his desire for Misato to have attended. Later in the film, we also see Shinji going out of his way to prepare lunch lunches for his classmates and making vegetarian food specifically for Rei, thus continuing his altruism and desire to make friends. Then during a battle with the 8th Angel, in which all three EVA pilots work together to defeat it, Shinji receives praise from Gendo and later reveals that his praise felt good. Shortly after, we also see Shinji express excitement to attend Rei's party after receiving her invitation. We don't really see Shinji behaving like Shinji until he is asked to kill Asuka by Gendo, where he refuses and is made to hate Gendo again after Gendo employs the dummy plug in order to override Shinji's Eva. Shinji once more characteristically throws a fit and threatens to destroy himself along with everyone in the Geo front, stating that he no longer cares about his life, saving the world, or being an Evangelion pilot. Following this episode of insubordination, Shinji quits being a pilot once again and becomes ambivalent towards the destruction of Nerve headquarters and marries near death at the hands of the 10th Angel. It isn't until Shinji witnesses Rei being assimilated by the 10th Angel that he becomes a pilot yet again and rescues Rei from disappearing completely. Okay, so after rewatching the film and analyzing Shinji's behavior, it is more than apparent that Hideaki Anno wanted to not only revamp the plot of Evangelion, but also alter the characters. Not only is Shinji a different character from his appearance in the original series, but he's also completely different from his depiction in Evangelion 1.1. 
To illustrate this, let's assume that Shinji is in fact a real person. In order for him to be taking initiative and cooking for himself and sharing with his friends, he must have had to overcome his depression in between the two films. One would assume in the real world that Shinji must have had therapy in the period of time between 1.1 and 2.2, or at the very least that Shinji was only going through a depressive episode as opposed to having persistent depressive disorder. Now let's just analyze the differences real quick and see where my initial analysis of Shinji's mental health was wrong in light of Evangelion 2.2's depiction. According to the American Psychiatric Association, a depressive episode usually includes the following symptoms. Low mood, sadness, hopelessness that things might improve, anhedonia, which is the inability to feel joy, distractibility and difficulty concentrating, emptiness and a sense of longing for something or someone who has been lost, psychomotor functioning difficulties, significant weight changes when not dieting, insomnia or hypersomnia, a sense of guilt, and a sense of worthlessness and suicidality. Obviously a few of these symptoms either don't apply to Shinji or can't be observed since we're talking about a fictional character in a cartoon, but a lot of them are pretty apparent. Now let's see why it's easy to confuse a depressive episode with persistent depressive disorder. According to Mayo Clinic, persistent depressive disorder includes the following symptoms. Sadness, emptiness or feeling down, loss of interest in daily activities, tiredness and lack of energy, low self-esteem, self-criticism or feeling you're not capable, trouble focusing clearly and trouble making decisions, problems getting things done well and on time, quickly becoming annoyed, impatient or angry, avoidance of social activities, feelings of guilt and worries over the past, poor appetite or overeating, sleep problems, and hopelessness. Now if that list of symptoms seems to be comically similar to depressive episode symptoms, it's because they are. Essentially, without knowing Shinji's full history prior to the events of Evangelion 1.1, it would be impossible to distinguish between the two conditions based on his behavior in 1.1. But is this really what's going on? Was Shinji simply having a depressive episode in 1.1 and then happened to recover, or is Hideaki Anno throwing us a curveball here? In order to better analyze why the characters seem to be different, let's now look at Misato to build a better case. In my first video, I assumed that Misato was suffering from hypersexuality in response to a trauma she had with her father. In Evangelion 2.2, we get a clearer background story about Misato's resentment toward her father when Ryoji Kaji explains to Shinji what happened to Misato during the second impact. Here he explains that Misato's father was so engrossed in his work that it is implied he neglected a relationship with her a fact that she resented while growing up. Her trauma, however, stems from the fact that her father saved her life during the second impact and gave her survivor's guilt, something which affected her and made her take up the duty to become a workaholic with nerve. This nuance about Misato's feelings toward her father explains why her relationship with him was estranged at first, but developed into a more complicated sentiment of debt and duty. This means that though Misato is probably still suffering from hypersexuality, her vector for these pathologies originates from PTSD, considering that survivor's guilt is in fact a type of PTSD. Let's also explain why Misato is such a workaholic for nerve, which is something that was not super obvious in the first film. According to VeryWellMind.com, which is a journal that publishes articles on mental health, following a trauma, people may also experience feelings of regret. They may ruminate over the events that took place and think about things they could have or should have done that they think would have altered the outcome. This rehashing of the events can further exacerbate feelings of guilt, particularly if people feel that their own actions or inactions may have worsened the consequences. In many cases, this rumination is influenced by what is known as the hindsight sight bias. People look back and overestimate their ability to have known the outcome of an event. Because they feel they should have predicted what happened, people may become convinced that they should have also been able to change the outcome. In other words, Misato is dedicated to nerve because she has hindsight bias, that had she been as knowledgeable as she is today, she could have either prevented the second impact or at the very least saved her father's life. This shows us that her motivation to invest as much time as she has at nerve stems from a need to make peace with her own trauma by preventing the third impact at all costs, something which is symbolized by the cross she wears around her neck, an artifact of the guilt and duty she bears to this day. So as we can see here, Misato is virtually the same character as she was in Evangelion 1.1, but what can we say about Rei? 
Rei Ayanami appears to have had an even more drastic change in her character, more so than Shinji. Though we saw Rei show glimpses of learning to become more human and normal, so to speak, during the penultimate scene in Evangelion 1.1, her characterization flipped dramatically through this film. Rei initially appears to be the same old Rei from the first film during the field trip to the Marine Preservation Zone, where she seems pretty emotionless and unresponsive to Asuka's taunts and insults. But this is pretty much the last time we get to see the Rei we're accustomed to, because she appears to have a turning point the moment Shinji offers her miso soup, and quite possibly eating her first ever enjoyable meal. Later we see Rei contemplating what words of gratitude are, and how she never thanked Shinji for the soup that she gave her. This leads into the following scene, where she is mysteriously absent from class, only for us to see that she's back at Nerf headquarters having a meal with Gendo. During this meal, she inquires whether sharing a meal with somebody is something enjoyable for Gendo, and whether Gendo enjoys having meals cooked for him. Upon realizing that this hypothetical scenario would be enjoyable for him, Rei cooks up, pun intended, a plan to make a meal for Gendo, Shinji, and the other kids, and have them all get closer to each other in appreciation of Shinji's care for her. We later see Rei taking initiative for once, and see her mysteriously washing a knife while standing next to a pot. A day later, after returning to class, we see her greet the class causing causing everyone to freak out, including Shinji, who runs over to see what the hell had gotten into Rei. Rei reveals while smirking that she's been practicing something which she cannot reveal until she becomes better at it, implying that she values the idea of surprising Shinji with her dinner plans, something which is baffling considering that a movie ago, she didn't give a crap about having her apartment snooped on, having a teenage boy see her naked body, or being groped. Yet now, all of a sudden, Rei understands that humans like surprises, and that Shinji longs to be closer to his father. Then, during a conversation with Asuka, it is implied that Rei is in love with Shinji, when she says that he makes her feel warm and fuzzy inside. And as such, she wants to do the same for Shinji by setting up the surprise dinner date. Yet it becomes obvious that she does not fully understand the concept of falling in love. Then, during the climax of the film, we see Rei disobeying Ritsuko and Misato's protests when she tries to kill the 10th angel with a missile, once it becomes apparent that Mary's outmatched by it. Her reasoning for doing so being that she does not want Shinji to ever fight in the Eva ever again. Rei not only fights an uphill battle for Shinji, but due to her pushing Mary in Unit 2 out of the way, also implies that she was aware that her endeavor could have very well been a suicide mission. Okay, so having highlighted all of these peculiarities regarding Rei's behavior, we can pretty much see how her character is no longer consistent with her behavior in Evangelion 1.1. In fact, it's so different that Rei magically understands the nuances of human behavior by deducing that though Shinji has spoken poorly of Gendo, he is somehow still in need of his approval and love. How Rei was able to deduce this is beyond me, but it shows that she is capable of higher level thinking something which I supposedly debunked by breaking down her inability to understand her own mistreatment by Gendo in my last video. Interestingly, we can see how both submissive and naive Rei is when it comes to her relationship with Gendo, unable to see him in any negative light, yet we see how mature and intelligent she is by planning to surprise Shinji with a dinner and getting him closer to his father. She also understands that one of Shinji's biggest pain points is having to pilot the Eva, so she puts herself on the line in order to keep him from fighting. But okay, before I go directly into how weird it is that Hideaki Anno basically rewrote the characters to seem slightly more normal than their Neon Genesis Evangelion and Evangelion 1.1 counterparts, I think it's important to look at two characters that are also very different, but that I did not include in my original video. One of these characters is Gendo. Though in my original review I said I would not compare these films to Neon Genesis Evangelion, I believe that at this stage in the story it is becoming evident that Anno is not trying to reboot the plot of Evangelion, but is also trying to update the character flaws he found unsatisfactory in the original series. Because of that, I just want to add additional evidence to this claim. Gendo in the original Neon Genesis Evangelion series was a non-redeemable character in every way, shape, and form. Gendo had no positive qualities in the original series, doing everything in his power to essentially murder everyone on Earth so that he could return to Yui. It is implied that he had to be as horrible as possible so that his death to Unit 1, aka Yui, could be a satisfying end to his story arc and thus conclude the narrative use of Evangelion's ultimate antagonist. But Gendo can't be that anymore. He is shown visiting Yui's grave with Shinji, taking the time to explain that her grave is a facade. 
Sure, Gendo is cold and doesn't say anything back when Shinji expresses gratitude for being able to talk to him, but it's still such a far cry from the original Gendo that I yelled at the TV when I first saw the scene, saying, this isn't Evangelion anymore. And then things got weirder, because the next instance of Gendo not behaving like Gendo was when he praised Shinji for his job when he assisted in taking out the 8th Angel, something which he'd never done in the original series. But the instance that takes the cake in this film for being uncharacteristically Gendo when he accepts Rei's suggestion to have a meal with his son. You see, Gendo in both the original series and in Evangelion 1.1 had been purposely written to be a no-nonsense asshole, his character was basically written to be the ultimate emotionless villain who only cared about his goals. But this Gendo has nuance purposely injected into him. He is humanized and is capable of thinking outside of the realm of his work, much like even the most workaholic human being alive. This makes it difficult to see him as an ultimate antagonist like in his original depiction, and it seems quite intentional to change the way we see Gendo. Now let's talk about Asuka. Much like the characters, say for Masato, this rendition of Asuka is not Asuka. We get the first impression that she's going to reflect the original version of her character when we first meet her and see how she interacts with Shinji and the rest of the kids. Her first interaction is riddled with Asuka-like behavior, where she talks poorly about Rei, calling her the commander's pet, and even before having a chance to meet Shinji, claims that he had no merit becoming the pilot of Unit 1, and simply rode his father's coattails to become an EVA pilot. Ah, that's the Asuka we all know and love. And later, when we find out that Asuka has been moved in with Misato, she again acts like her bitchy self by showing anger that she has to be roommates with Shinji. But what started to baffle me about her was how all of a sudden she was rude to Misato, something which the original Asuka was not. The differences don't end there though. You see, Asuka seems to be more brazenly disagreeable in the first half of the film, sticking to herself and sulking more than the Neon Genesis Evangelion version of herself ever did. And even though she seems bothered in the film to receive assistance during her fight with the 8th Angel, she seems much more bothered with the idea of not being able to accomplish her tasks by herself. Having said that, it seems that Asuka has a much more mature way of handling her attraction to Shinji, because although it is apparent that Asuka feels jealousy towards Rei and Shinji's friendship, when she finds out that there has to be a pilot available to test out Unit 3, she takes her responsibility with dignity and allows Shinji and Rei to have their dinner without protest. She also shows more maturity when she talks to Misato about how she is more open to being around other people and learning to be a more tolerant and social person. Before her accident with Unit 3, her willingness to speak to Misato about her change of heart indicates that this Asuka is less rigid and willing to learn from her mistakes when it comes to interpersonal dynamics, very much unlike the Asuka of Neon Genesis Evangelion. These differences now lead me to the most blaring and telling of them all. The reason this Asuka is so unlike her Neon Genesis Evangelion counterpart is because she's not even the same character. As most of you who have seen both the series and the Rebuild movies, you guys would have already noticed that this Asuka is named Asuka Langley Shikinami instead of Asuka Langley Soryu. So why would Hideaki Anno do something like this? Well, this leads me to the following belief. I believe that Evangelion 2.2 is the beginning of the divergence of the Rebuild series and the Neon Genesis Evangelion continuity at large. Okay, what do I mean by this? Well, considering that Evangelion 1.1 was an alternative retelling of the first six episodes of Evangelion, it is implied that Hideaki Anno was pleased enough with the original setup of the series as a means to introduce the story, but that the rest of the plot needed to be revamped. This is why there's a huge disconnect between the Shinji of Evangelion 1.1 and the Shinji of Evangelion 2.2, because they're no longer meant to be the same characters. Essentially, the rebuild of Evangelion starts in 2.2, and as such, Hideaki Anno is finally given the full liberty to explore an alternate version of his vision. As we all know, Neon Genesis Evangelion suffered from production issues, causing tensions and creative conflicts between Anno and his producers. It is also very evident that near the end of the series, Anno's story was limited by budget constraints, which is partly why episodes 25 and 26 were super minimalist. This of course led Anno to create the end of Evangelion as a way to describe the actual physical events of the third impact and to fuse the continuity of Neon Genesis Evangelion with this finale in the film. And well, because there is a precedence with Hideaki Anno fine-tuning his creative work, I can only assume that the Rebuilt series was Anno's way to better reflect his vision after securing the funds and creative liberties to do whatever he wanted to do. 
as such, based on seeing how Evangelion 2.2 no longer has the feel nor plot elements of the original series, neither should the characters. 2.2 therefore marks a rebirth in the story of Evangelion. So having stated that, what changes are now propelling the story forward? Well, I think groundedness is a commonality. For example, Shinji is no longer a stereotypical depressed boy as seen in the original series. The old absolutism of his behavior had been killed, and now he is defined by much more realistic depictions of depression. In the same way that Robin Williams was a joy to watch on screen, and was defined by his ability to make others smile, you know, despite his depression and eventual suicide, Shinji is now defined by being nuanced and balanced, capable of making friends and making others around him happy and secure. This change no longer makes Shinji a caricature of depression, but rather a more realistic depiction of people who go through depressive episodes and hide them when they're around others. This makes for greater ambiguity in the full context of the Rebuilt series moving forward, as character motivations are more marked by a series of factors rather than one-dimensional motives. Rei no longer being as naive and separated from her humanity as depicted in Evangelion 1.1 is also an interesting change meant to add to the credence that just like anybody else, she is the sum of her nature as well as how she was nurtured. In my last video reviewing 1.1, I struggled to find a realistic pathology to describe Rei's personality because she was so prototypical of an android despite her going to school with other kids and being around actual human adults. In this version of her character, however, she starts to resemble more the pathologies of somebody who has been abused and isolated but finally given a chance to interact with others and learn about socializing. So though it's still pretty ridiculous that Rei cannot understand the concept of love despite experiencing it, she is still significantly more grounded than in her previous iterations. Rei for once feels real and vulnerable. The same can be said about Gendo, as he now resembles more of an asshole workaholic with an ability to empathize, albeit we see that it's only because he remembers Yui and Rei's appearance. But still, the man feels more like a man now. And as far as Asuka Langley Shikinami, her ability to realize her own flaws also grounds her and shows us that we are no longer dealing with a cartoon character, but with a highly conflicted individual. So in making these observations, I believe that Hideaki Anno is truly describing himself by splitting his personality into the different archetypes of his development as an individual. As we all know, most people are complex with very few knuckleheads around representing one single archetype. But okay. If Evangelion 2.2 represents the shift from cut and dry storytelling to an ambiguous and realistic exploration of the human spirit, then what does the shift in the plot now represent? In order to even attempt to answer that, I'm going to have to go back to the climax of Neon Genesis Evangelion. In the original series, Shinji was so badly crippled by his depression that his personal instrumentality focused on getting him to understand the importance of his own ego. He is psychoanalyzed in episodes 25 through 26 by his inner projections of the other characters. Here he learns that his depression has been acting as a barrier to experience his own failures in life. It is explained that it was fear of pain that paradoxically caused his own pain, and in forfeiting the chance to experience pain, he also forfeited the chance to experience happiness. The major lesson of his mind approaching instrumentality being that there cannot be love nor joy without being willing to experience rejection and pain. This is further illustrated when Shinji experiences complete freedom, being suspended in an open world. Here he realizes that complete freedom is useless, because if there are no limitations to his freedom, then there is no point in being free. We see a floor being added where Shinji now has to be confined to, and he realizes that now he can move in any direction or view himself from any angle. Therefore, by sacrificing some of his freedom, he realizes that he can do more things because he has a reference point. This revelation continues when he is told that his own self-image can only exist in the context of other individuals, and though a lot of his life has been painful, he wasn't the only one to be subject to pain, thus proving that life is defined by limitations and perceptions. Because Shinji felt like he was drifted away when he was represented as a pencil sketch on a white plane, he determines that it is better to choose to continue to live in a world of limitations and choose to change the course of an uncertain future rather than to disintegrate completely and never have the opportunity to suffer again. The way the series concluded with Shinji rejecting instrumentality shows us 
that he needed to have a foot in the real world and one in instrumentality for him to understand that the hedgehog's dilemma is literally the only true path to experiencing joy despite the pain that it brings, thus showing us the absolutism of Shinji's nihilistic and pessimistic view of life. However, the climax in Evangelion 2.2 paints a more nuanced picture, because assuming that the general rules of the angels is the same in the Rebuild series, a human ego cannot exist with them, and thus, the third impact has to happen to establish order in the world. So, when Shinji plans on getting Rei back from the 10th angel, we can imply that his ego is growing as a manifestation of his willpower to save Rei. According to author of the Eva manga, Satomoto says the following, On the floor of the midbrain is the ventral tegmental system that neurobiologists call region A10. Cells soaked in dopamine, certain emotions are processed here, such as the thoughts of two lovers or of a parent and child. And it is the synchronization of the threads and bundles of A10 that splice Pilot and Eva together to become one entity to fight. In other words, the power of love drives this weapon of mass destruction. So in a complete table-flipping series of events, Shinji's now-realistic representation of his depression took a backseat to rescue Rei and caused the synchronization levels to skyrocket with Unit 1 and caused it to go berserk. And then something interesting happens. The moment Shinji decides to rescue Rei, Unit 1 undergoes a physical transformation that emulates one of the atoms as seen in Neon Genesis Evangelion and during the second Impact flashback with Misato. We are also informed of a couple things. Number 1. Unit 1 starts to resemble a godlike entity, and, number 2, the moment Shinji reaches in to pull Rei out, the third impact initiates. Well then, let's break down the first observation. Why in the world would Unit 1 go full divine if the Evas are DNA vestiges of Adam and, well in Unit 1's case, Lilith? I mean, if the angels aren't divine to the extent of Adam or Lilith, why should Unit 1 have a halo and go full god mode? Well, whether or not this phenomenon is explained in the following entries of the Rebuild series, I do have a hypothesis. When we see Shinji say, give me back Ayanami, we temporarily see his eyes turn red, mimicking Rei's eyes. And since we already know that Rei is part divine and houses Lilith's soul, and Kaworo is an angel and also has red eyes, we can assume that Shinji momentarily becomes divine by creating an ego so powerful that it mimics Lilith's ego. Why Lilith's ego specifically? Well, that can be explained pretty easily due to the fact that humans are supposedly genetic descendants of Lilith. Now, on his own, Shinji would not be fully divine due to the physical limitations of his human body, but because he is a son of Lilith, creating an AT field comparable to Lilith, and is paired with an Eva that is basically a clone of Lilith, Shinji momentarily becomes an unrestrained Lilith. Remember that Lilith can also have these attributes given that her physical body is reunited with its soul, and the Spear of Longinus is removed, as we've seen at the end of Evangelion. Because of this, we can infer that Shinji is a pseudo-Lilith, having had all the necessary components to create an artificial creation force. Now let's talk about the third impact and how its near instigation proves that Shinji momentarily became Lilith. Things are going to get confusing, so bear with me. As seen in the end of Evangelion, Third Impact was instigated by having Lilith's soul, in this case Rei, merge with Lilith's divine body already carrying the fruit of knowledge, and with Adam's body, as long as the merged entity could obtain the fruit of life. Well, since Unit 1 in the original series obtained the fruit of life from Zeriel and absorbed it, Rei was able to instigate the Third Impact as soon as she absorbed Unit 1, and thus obtained Godhood by possessing the bottoms of Adam and Lilith, as well as two fruits of knowledge from Shinji and Lilith, and a fruit of life from Unit 1. Now if we look at what happened during the end of Evangelion 2.2, we can see that the same prerequisites were met. Rei, being Lilith's soul, merged with Adam when the 10th angel assimilated her into its fruit of life. My reasoning for this is because angels are already children of Adam, and are divine like Adam. The reason this didn't cause the third impact in and of itself though, was because though Rei may or may not have had a fruit of knowledge, she does not possess Lilith's divine body. After all, she is half human. So when Shinji pulls her out of the 10th angel, we start to see a vortex that looks like the one from the second impact, because that's the moment where Lilith, which is Unit 1, because remember, it's a clone of Lilith, starts to have direct contact with Adam and is merged with Lilith's soul. This means that we have two divine souls, and even when the 10th angel gets killed by Shinji, we can see the fruit of life being merged with Rei, which explains why, even with the 10th angel's death, we can continue to see the vortex until Shinji is stopped by Kawara's Spear of Longinus. 
Now the one assumption that I have to make in order for this theory to make sense is that Rey now not only possesses a fruit of life, but also Adam's body, making her three quarters divine, and is only Lilith's physical body shy of being able to cause the third impact. But okay, what does this all mean then? Well, I think the biggest takeaway is that Shinji's ego was powerful enough to mimic that of Lilith's ego, and in doing so, reverted Unit 1's form into an unrestricted clone of Lilith. From what I understand, Evas have to be cyborgs, not to make them stronger per se, but rather to contain their angelic properties, as seen with how Berserk Mode happens when all the Eva safety protocols are compromised. Because of this reality, Shinji is fundamentally a different character, and the plot can no longer revolve around Shinji's desire to dissolve his ego like in the original series, but something more grounded than that. And sure, Shinji still suffers from depression, but its new depiction is balanced, and the fact that he has initiative and is willing to risk everything for love shows as a foundational change in the narrative of the Rebuild series. This also explains why the other characters cannot be the same as they were before because Hideaki Anno has grown since he's created Neon Genesis Evangelion, and his characters have to reflect that growth. So, is Hideaki Anno making a statement about love and its power to transcend depression in moments of need, or is he making a critique of how love can fuel egos for both good and bad? Well, to be honest, it's difficult to find a satisfactory answer to this question at this point in the film series. But after analyzing the way this film changed her preconceived notions about Evangelion, I'm willing to make that claim. And to conclude, I'm going to quote Dr. Kai McDonald from UC San Diego Health, where he states the following. In humans, oxytocin is released when they hug or experience other pleasant physical touch. That's why oxytocin is sometimes called the love hormone. Later adding, studies of blood levels and genetic factors in depressed patients point to the possibility that this natural hormone might play a part in helping clinical depression. So maybe Hideaki Anno found solace in his depression through love of others or maybe he just found a temporary escape. But if one lesson remains certain, in a world full of suffering, adversity, and evil, unless you have love in your heart, you cannot advance.